Hi everyone. Um, so I'm putting this clip in because there are some useful terms that we should have covered in this meeting, but that we didn't like really get into that much. And so I thought it would be helpful to add like a little bit of definition that these are my notes. So it's extremely subjective, but I hope it helps. And you can pause the video um, if you want to like read it more. Thank you. Bye. We'll just get started with the first thing, which is uh, like just introducing ourselves to one another. Um, so your name, where you live, uh, what you do, whatever that means, and then um, kind of like uh, what your relationship to Marxism is. Um, so uh, do you want to go first, Zane? No, I don't remember the questions. <laughs> okay okay um so like well yeah i guess we we know your name because we can see it too um i realize that my name looks like nora here which is my sister's name because i'm using her zoom account um but yeah just like uh where you live like kind of what you spend your days doing like what you do and then what your relationship to marxism is so like three questions uh okay so i live in el paso um, I spend all day at home with my dog, pretty much. Uh, and I mean, I've been trying to learn since I, I moved to El Paso about a little less than a year ago. And it's pretty much been like the whole time I've been here, I've been like learning about Marx. I don't know, specifically. Um. Okay, cool. And then where did you move from? Austin. I went to UT. I graduated last spring. Okay, cool. Nice. Good to meet you. And then um, Raviv. Uh, hi, I'm Raviv. Um, I live in Ann Arbor right now. I do like, um, like math for this like independent research unit, I guess. Um, and I've just, I, I've kind of been really into philosophy for the past few years of my life as kind of a hobby. And, uh, I got into March through that. Uh, and I think he's a really interesting thinker. So, yeah. Okay, cool. And then, um, do you want to go next Gray or Zapato? Wait, is Gray still here? Is having Wi Fi troubles. Oh, okay. Okay, no worries. And then, um, okay, then uh, El Paso crew, you can go ahead. I guess, yeah. My name is Rojas. I, um, I farm and I like eat things often. That's most of my days. And my relationship to Marxism was, I was first introduced to it in um, college through organizing I was doing. Some of the folks, some of the organizations I belong to were like uh, Marxist-Leninist orgs. So it was like a very praxis relationship to Marxism. So I'd never read it until like years and years later, until like last year actually. Um, but had like called myself a Marxist for a long time and was like familiar with a lot of his ideas, but had never read him. Um, and yeah, that's my relationship to Marxism is uh, slowly starting to read more, but yeah. Um, hi, my name is Chris. Um, I'm going to do some fumble around. Um, me and I, uh, my speaker is very bad. You might want to um, project. My name is Yumi. 
Um, Just be quiet, yeah. Oh, my name is Chris. Hi. I uh, live in El Paso. Um, I moved here from elsewhere. Um, <laughs> and uh, me and Raymond do COVID-19 stuff. Um, like giving it out? Or? Yeah, like we Jesus. do that. <laughs> we uh, tell people where they can get vaccines and tested. And um, that's a, that's a shit. Um, and I like Mark <laughs> because um, he's got some really cool things to say. Um, and I read a little bit of it before, um, but I tried to do it again. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Raymond. Um, I live here in El Paso. Um, I'm with Chris doing COVID vaccine outreach, El Budget Spikes. Um, Ross's description of like um, where he was, like how he was involved in like Marxist learning and stuff, um, like a few years ago, and then like since then he's been like reading it and stuff. So I'm like baby Ross. <laughs> baby, baby Ross. <laughs> Um, so I haven't, this is my first time reading Marx. Um, I don't think I've been really a part of that many groups that are like Marxist led in it, but um, I think recently I guess I've been reading more about like historical groups um, in like Indonesia and around the world that were like Marxist um, or are Marxist. Hi, guys. Cool. Um, great. If you're Wait, it's nice to meet you guys. Um, <laughs> um, and then, uh, uh, Gray, if you uh, if your Wi-Fi is okay, uh, do you want to um, introduce yourself? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Okay. So we're doing um, names, uh, what you like, spend your days doing, and then your relationship to Marxism. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah. Sorry for ke I keep coming in and out and stuff, but I think I think we should be solid now. Um, yeah, I'm Gray, um, and I spend most of my days now, I guess, I guess just like trying to keep busy with like little activities. I've been getting into baking a little bit more, which I've like never really done before, but I've baked a bit in the past few weeks and that's been cool. Um, just doing like things for my job and just like hanging out with people and kind of trying to get outside more. Um, I don't know. Very casual, like boring, but it's nice. <laughs> um, and my relation with Marx, I've never, I've never read any of his work before. I've always kind of found it a bit like too intimidating. Um, but that's why I guess I joined this book club because I think it's like um, just going to be like really helpful and encouraging to just like hear what you all have to say and like um, I don't know, and just like to be able to talk about it with someone really cool and I think it's like a good way to become more familiar with his work so yeah just a baby but that's it and it's good to see you guys all <laughs> El Paso people it's so good to see you guys I missed you uh, um yeah I miss you guys too also um this is a good way for us to also like uh, keep connected in this like very uh, I don't know yeah stuff is still strange and we're all like going in different directions after this so like this is a good way of keeping in contact and um, and getting to talk about like interesting stuff while we're at it um, is that Sam <laughs> wait who's that I can't see it's Grace Oh, it's Grace. Hello. Oh my God, I, I couldn't even tell. She was so distant. Hello, Grace. Hello. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> I used to live in El Paso. Okay. Um, I, was like, I was like, I think that's Nina, but then I couldn't tell if your name said Nina on there. So I, was... I changed it to Young Lean. Um, my... <laughs> um, okay. And then, uh, okay, yeah, my name is uh, Lena, aka Young Lean. Um, and I, uh, oh, the city I'm in right now is Huntington Woods, Michigan, which is a sub, it's just like a suburb near Detroit. It's where my, I grew up. I've been in this house my whole life. Um, and um, I'm just staying with my parents while my ankle heals. Uh, I spend my days 
just like now reading a lot, like trying to plan out my master's degree in Egypt, which I just found out is a two year program, which probably says a lot about me. So um, <laughs> the fact that I just found that out. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I've been hanging out with my parents' friends a lot. They're cool. Um, and to, to give you an idea of like, oh, and, and then my relationship to Marxism. Um, my parents were like um, Marxist activists in the eighties. Oh, thanks Zapata. Um, and then uh, they, uh, they were Palestinian activists. Um, and so they, um, didn't like raise me very like like it wasn't like that overt but like I just grew up with like Marx being in the house and then um like not physically just like his books and then um I mean like his spirit you know the it's the ghost uh and then uh a couple Christmases ago they gave me this for yeah um so uh so I, I this was like what I was going to read from to like do a little bit of intro just because it's like short and accessible and it talks a bit about um like Marx and his relation like like what capital grew out of um yeah that's uh that's me and then um I see Colton has joined uh do you wanna hi nice to meet you do you wanna um so we're just like uh going over like uh your name like I mean yeah Colton yes and then um uh where you're living what you spend your days doing these days and then um what's your relationship to marxism cool yeah sorry for joining late um yeah raviv just told me this was going on and it sounded fun so um anyways yeah my name's cold my pronouns are he and him and um i'm living in ann arbor i'm living on packard um pretty close to owen and i assume there's some other owen people in here but um yeah, I, I graduated in 2020 from Michigan, and this last year I was working at the Blue Nile, the Ethiopian restaurant. Uh, stopped doing that. I'm going to grad school next year, so I now I'm just kind of doing nothing for like two months, um, doing a lot of reading and stuff, which is chill. Um, and my relationship to Marx, uh, I study philosophy, um, and I haven't really done much continental philosophy, including Marx. I mean, I had like just a very basic understanding of like some of the tenets of Marx, but I think I sympathized with like a lot of Marx's conclusions without actually understanding Marx. So um, yeah, I, I ended up, I bought Das Kapital like probably like eight months ago now. And I read like the first hundred pages, which I think was what is being covered today. So, and I was like, I really enjoyed it. Just, I didn't end up following up, but yeah, this is a good excuse for me to continue. Nice, that's exciting. Um, it's good to meet you. Um, I think uh, the, the general plan that, uh, that I have for this meeting is to sort of, um, let's see, first of all, go over like um, uh, a general like biography, uh, of Marx and then um, and then uh, Raviv is gonna like, we're, we're just gonna talk a bit about like his, the like philosophical underpinnings and like Marx's relationship with the Western canon and like um, uh, like what intersections he has um, in, uh, in that. And then, um, yeah, and then, uh, and then we're just gonna talk a little bit about like what people get out of this text generally and like what, like why we're doing it. And then, um, and then I have a bit, a bit of a prompt to get us. So like, uh, just like a bit of a writing prompt so that we can, that'll like generate thoughts before we jump into like talking about terms and like what Marx is talking about with this first chapter in general. Um, yeah. And then, um, and then maybe at the end we can sort of uh, dish out like, okay, if people want to, um, uh, like, what next steps will be for like, uh, who will, who will facilitate different meetings um, after this? There, are, I I plan to have like twelve installments. That way we could have it be like, um, like a foreseeable like just having it be in twelve weeks, and then there's going to be this end, and then we can try to like hopefully start volume two. Um, 
and like complete the the whole three but um that's just my idea i don't know if people if uh if there'll be interest in that but yeah um yeah so uh first of all does um like is there does anybody know like a general biography about uh, Marx or like what like what do you already know about his um yeah Unmute, unmute. Okay, born in 1818. Sure. Facts. Uh, <laughs> family, converted to Christianity, influenced by Hegel. Uh, the Communist Manifesto with Engels. The Engels in Paris in 1844. Um, we were to that part. What is that? I guess he never died. He's still with us. He's in my house. Um, facts. Uh, if you if you guys want, I can start. That th those are. Um, thank you so much. Are those your notes, Rojas? No, we turned to page one of our book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think. Okay. Okay, yeah, so uh, I, I don't want this to be too dull, but like, um, yeah, this, this, this book, uh, it talks about how Marx was born in Trier, Germany, um, near the French border, um, 1818, just after the Napoleonic Wars, um, one year before David Ricardo published his path-breaking work, The Principles of Political Economy, which now that I've read the first chapter, I've read that like really long footnote where he like, tears Ricardo apart. Um, yeah, and then after he received a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Jena, Marx soon returned to revolutionary politics. He arrived at the conclusion that capitalism oppresses and exploits working people, analyzing how this happens and organizing working people to replace capitalism with communism became Marx's lifelong preoccupation. Um, Marx remained an ardent revolutionary until his death in 1883 and never wavered in his conviction that uh, the working class can and must abolish production for profit and build instead a society based on freely associated labor engaged in production for use. Um, and then though capital was Marx's life work, uh, he never completely finished it. Um, but it was, but he was uh, hardly an armchair revolutionary. Um, and then it talks about how he was the editor of the Rhenish Gazette in 1842 um, in Prussia. And um, he was only 24 at the time and then was quickly immersed in politics. Um, he had already, already become a radical philosopher and exponent of critic and critic of uh, Hegel and Feuerbach. Um, and he was deeply impressed by an uprising by the um, Silesian weavers, which kind of, if you've already read it, kind of explains the, the linen um, coat uh, uh, analogies that he continues to use throughout it. Um, and then uh, he was also uh, uh, deeply impressed by the misery and oppression of the Moselle wine growers. Um, and as a journalist, he took sides in the battles that he reported putting forward a radical defense of um, the rebel Silesian weavers and strongly arguing for their democratic rights. Um, and so the Prussian authorities grew increasingly unhappy with Marx deciding after several months to suppress the Rhenish Gazette altogether. So dramatic was this turn of events in the eyes of Marx's German contemporaries that Marx became a celebrity of sorts, shown in one editorial cartoon as the mythic Prometheus chained to a rock in punishment for stealing the, the fire to the gods. Um, and then he was uh, expelled to France. And then um, in France, he converted to socialism. Uh, the first fruits of Marx's initial foray into an economics included the Holy Family, um, which was published in collaboration with Frederick Engels uh, in 1843, which was his, uh, he, uh, co-published with his publisher. Um, and then in 1845, he signed a book 
of economics um, and he thought it would finish pretty quickly, but then he realized the project, like the project just started going out of hand. Um, and so it became a, a much bigger project. And so then 16 years elapsed, elapsed before uh, Capital was published. Um, and the remainder of the work wasn't published until after Marx's death with Engels as an editor. Um, and then soon after Marx began his intensive work on economics, um, they were thrown out of France and then they moved to Brussels, uh, Marx and um, his partner, um, and they joined a secret uh, League of the Just, which was a radical workers organization, which soon changed its name to the Communist League. Um, and then uh, Engels joined also, and after completing his first published work on the capitalist economy, um, an essay against Proudhon, which there have also been like a bunch of uh, footnotes where he's like railing against, um, uh, entitled The Poverty of Philosophy, uh, Marx was asked to collaborate with Engels on the Manifesto of the Communist League or the Communist Manifesto. Um, and it became really famous and uh, encapsulated Marx and Engels' theory of class struggle, which uh, issued in 1848, the year of revolutions. Um, and then revolutions broke out in France, Germany, Hungary, and uh, elsewhere in 1848. There were revolutions of the rising capitalist class against feudal reaction combined with revolts of artisans and workers. Um, and then Marx and Engels rushed to publish to Germany, rushed to Germany to publish the new Rhenish Gazette. Um, and then uh, it was in the pages of this revolutionary democratic newspaper that Marx had published a series of lectures uh, that he'd first delivered in 1847 about wage labor and capital. Um, and then um, after, after the defeat of uh, the revolution in Germany, uh, Marx was tried uh, for sedition, but he stirred a speech and was acquitted, um, my guy. And then um, even so, uh, Carl and his partner Jenny were booted out of Germany again. And this time they went to England where Engels was also settled because uh, his Engels' father owned a factory in Manchester. And then um, Marx began 12 years of work as a foreign correspondent uh, for the New York Herald Tribune. Um, and several other newspapers, including the Vienna Press. And at first, Marx and Engels tried to keep the Communist League alive, but they soon decided it was no longer useful. Um, and without a mass movement to sustain it, the group was becoming an emigre sect, um, splitting hairs in political isolation. And then in 1858, Marx's studies had progressed to the point where he was able to draft a 1,400-page outline of his entire projected critique of political economy. And then um, this outline known as the Grundris is a major work in his own right, presaging um, most themes in capital. Uh, yes, and he devoted all of his time to studying uh, journalism and capitalism. Um, and then in 1859, he uh, published a contribution to the critique of political economy, summarizing some of the basic ideas developed from the Gundries. Um, and this is extremely an extremely valuable prologue to capital, um, far more valuable for the understanding of Marx's theory of value than it's often realized. Um, but uh, it's even more thorough than capital on the question of money. And then in 1865, as the leader of the International Working Men's Association, which had just formed and soon became a sizable body, Marx replied at length to an argument against strikes against another key member of the group, John Weston, who was a carpenter. Um, and then Marx's later, make Marx's reply later published in his pamphlet form by his daughter, Eleanor, expressed in a concise form many of his most vital ideas. These ideas won general approval in the IWA, the International Worker Men's Association, um, perhaps better known as the First International. Um, and then volume one was published, uh, of Das Kapital was published in 1867 and rolled off the presses to be immediately greeted um, uh, among the workers press and the capitalist press, uh, it'll come as no surprise, ignored it entirely. Um, Marx felt that he had reached an important milestone with the capital, uh, with Das Kapital as a publication, and uh, it was placed 
uh, as a necessary theoretical weapon in the hands of the workers' movement. Um, in volume one, he demonstrates that capitalism is based on the exploitation of working men, women, and children. All of these basic facts of modern society are analyzed from profits to prices to wages um, and the working day why labor products are commodities, why mo money is so powerful, where capital or originates and why economic crises happen. All these marks analyses with searching care. And then Engels had been busy promoting capital um, as had others in the international. Still, it didn't sell very well. And uh, Karl Marx's mom said, I wish you'd made money instead of just writing about it. Um, rude. And then in 1871, the Paris Commune took place. Uh, and then, um, let's see, it was where Parisian workers uh, and small independent producers had occurred, uh, like an, they upri they, there was an uprising, and then um, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 broke out. Um, and so the workers of Paris decided to take matters into their own hands. Um, and then in March in 1871, they toppled the government and seized the reins of power. By means of energetic discipline and the radically de democratic measures, these working men and women reconstituted Paris as a social commune. Marx declared the Paris Commune as the first example of the dictatorship of the proletariat. He meant the working class ruling itself democratically in his own name while fighting off the counter-revolutionary efforts of the displaced capitalist class. But now something unusual in the military annals took place. After two glorious months in the commune, the French and Prussian armies, once at each other's throat, harboring not the slightest tender feelings for one another, united to oppose the Parisian workers. Before long, the military effort to overwhelm the commune met with success. A white terror, much more brutal than the terror of the French Revolution of 1793 followed. More than a thousand, a hundred thousand communards were, were killed, and a thousand more were exiled. It was at this fateful juncture that Marx set about revising capital for a French translation. This appeared as a, seni, as a series of penny pamphlets intended for the Parisian working people between 1872 and 1875. Marx's French publisher was an exiled communard. Marx's goal was to communicate his analysis of capitalism and the class struggle, struggle to the survivors of the commune. He hoped that it would help them regroup and rethink their strategy. Um, and then it says, capital is a work for everybody who lives, uh, who works for a living in the shadow of a boss. It argues that capitalism is a world system based on wage labor. The relevance of Marx's capital grows as wage labor extends into all corners of the earth. Um, that is it. Yes. And then, uh, and then it starts talking about commodities, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, that's the thing. I, what I liked about this intro was its focus on, um, like Marx's praxis and, uh, what circumstances he was in, like, uh, his involvement with the Paris Commune and like what publications he was using to, uh, to like excite the working class and to make it as accessible as possible. And I think that we're starting with something that's like really difficult. Um, uh, but at the same time, this like difficult text is uh, something that a lot of my, um, a lot of my professors, a lot of people in academia continue to read every year. And like, it, it's like kept with them as, uh, as something to read in conjunction with like literally everything else that they read and it's uh it's like a very interdisciplinary text in in the way that i see it um yeah uh raviv did you want to talk about um his role in the western canon and philosophy yeah 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 sure so i guess like um the the first thing i wanted to say is that marx uh, Marx's project, Marx, what's Marx, what's uh, the beginning probably of what's known as critical theory, which uh, can be seen kind of as this like, uh, like Lena was just alluding to, like this interdisciplinary kind of um, 
a field that uh, takes tools from philosophy and economics and sociology, uh, psychology very frequently, and it kind of uses all these tools in uh, a kind of weaponized way to attack like whatever the present state of things is or whatever the theorist establishes as the present state of things. Um, often like one of the biggest projects for anyone developing critical theory is not only to criticize what's going on, but even to just state what's going on in the first place. Um, and I don't think Marx is an exception to that. Um, another thing I would say, so yeah, um, I think that's part of one of the difficulties uh, of, of capital that I noticed when I was reading it is Marx will be simultaneously making a philosophical argument and an economic argument and saying something about, about social theory and, and, and sociology or making a cultural argument. And he's, he's really doing everything at once, which is why this book is so impressive, but it's also um, why you need to be on your toes, I think, while you're reading it. Um, the other thing I think I wanted to talk about before I get into like um, maybe some of his influences is the fact that um, the word Marxism in the way it's used today is like a very, very abused word. And often people use the word Marxism to say something that doesn't actually have a whole lot to do with Marx himself. Um, and, and obviously there's the examples of, you know, people on the right or the intellectual dark web or whatever, just saying Marxism to mean basically whatever they want. But also on the left, there's a lot of people who equate Marxism to a specific political project or a specific political program. And like Lena explained, it's impossible to, to separate Marx's uh, philosophical life from his political dealings, but it's also, I think, important to recognize that the project he's doing in Capital, specifically, he, he didn't see as, um, he, he didn't see it as like a, a specific political like program of action. Um, and I think the end result of that, in my opinion, is that many different tendencies in, in leftist political action all have claims to Marxism. They all, they're all uh, claiming to be Marxist in some way, or I mean, some of them aren't. And I guess the a point I wanted to make is it's, it is possible to conceive, for instance, of a communist project without Marx. And it's, it, you can conceive of Marxism separate from a communist project. You can, under, you can read Marx and understand it and accept it and, and, not, and, and not even come to a revolutionary conclusion. Uh, although I would argue that would be a pretty lazy reading, but, um, and, and people have done this, or you can, you can come to the conclusion that you wanna be a communist or a socialist or an anarchist and completely reject a lot of the frameworks that Marx is using. So um, I, I, think, I think it's important to like, um, I, I think it's it, it, I, my opinion, and this is, I'm not like, I don't wanna frame myself as like any kind of expert or anything, but uh, my opinion is that it would actually be beneficial for the left to be able to separate Marxism as a school of thought from Marxism as a political project, because arguably Marx did not see capital as uh, something that was a part of the proletarian movement. As Lena mentioned, like a lot of the things that were happening around him were um, these proletarian uprisings and stuff. And he was very excited about that, but, um, from what I understand, he never thought of capital, for instance, as something that was um, a part of that movement, just something that would 
be could be used in tandem with it. I think he was quoted as saying that the most useful thing a revolutionary could do with capital is throw it at someone's head, like a, a bourgeois person's head or something like that. And um, that's not to diminish like the real power that like his theory has for revolutionary capabilities, but I, I'm just saying like Marx's politics were that whatever the proletarian movement is would be the correct thing to do, um, for at least from what I've read about it. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that. I don't know if that made anything way more confusing, but I guess um, when I when I I think that Marxism should be viewed as a framework for 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 a socioeconomic analysis, and not as a positive account of like, oh the like, just oh we should do communism because I think that's a, a gross reduction of what he was trying to do, and it. Um, can be limiting even to think that only one one political tendency is viable um, when, when it comes to Marx. Um, anyway, uh, I'm, I've kind of been rambling. Can I talk a little bit about like some of his influences and stuff? Yeah, so I think uh, the two, there's two kind of threads that you can pull from uh, to look at where Marx is coming from. The first is, um, Marx's upbringing in philosophy um, in Germany at the time, um, they right before Marx was around, there had been this huge development in continental philosophy um, called uh, German idealism. And it basically starts with Kant, who just to, to really flagrantly summarize is, is basically arguing that like, um, uh, like the outside world is inaccessible to us insofar as we only experience things through like sense perception and we only really experience the world as mediated by our minds. And so the kind of crux of idealism is this idea that mind creates world to some extent and understanding the world is kind of secondary to understanding the function of like um subjectivity and like uh how like the mind shapes the world um a good example of this is like uh the perception of a rainbow right just something that's not physically there but something that is a function of our perceptual apparatus and becomes part of the world in that sense so um idealism is kind of this idea that like uh, human uh, intelligence or, or cognition is like um, as much a, a part of the metaphysics of reality as like a material thing or arguably more so that we can't even access material things without talking about you know me being mediated by like phenomena. Um, specifically there is a guy named Hegel who was mentioned earlier and like um I, i've been, i've spent like the past like six months or so trying to get into hegel and it's really difficult and i i don't want to like get too much in the weeds but I, a couple of things that i think are important to marx is um hegel saw um historical human development as ha as following a, a specific logic and believe that um, insofar as like mind creates world, human ideas and concepts offer a guiding principle in the development of human society. For instance, like um, one of the things he said is that like the idea of freedom and what freedom as a concept entails um, has changed radically throughout human history and that um, the progression of human society can be seen as people realizing oh freedom actually means this and then reorienting the society to accommodate for that and then later being like oh actually no we want freedom to incorporate this also and then 
moving forward. Um, so that's an idea of, of uh, a human concept, an idea kind of shaping, shaping the world and its development. Um, um, Marx, Mar you, you may have heard that Marx is, is not an idealist in this sense. And that's, that's true, but it's, it's also important to know that he was a Hegelian and like his project is, is firmly within the Hegelian tradition. And um, the way that people say that Marx is a materialist and the way that that's true is that Marx was, because I remember I was talking about how idealism is about mind shaping world. And Marx was actually interested in the other direction. You know, the idea that, you know, world shapes mind also, the material conditions of, you know, someone's existence also shapes the way that they view the world. And so it's kind of this like dialectical pattern where mind and world both influence each other. And I think that's kind of what Marx is coming from. So the, the phrase that's often used is that Marx flips Hegel on his head because Hegel saw the view of history as an idea influencing the world as it develops. But Marx said actually that has it backwards that we should see the world as influencing ideas and development tracked and tracking is that. Um, you may have heard of the concept of uh, dialectical materialism in that sort in that sense. And um, that's an example of, of an idea that is actually not Marx, but often gets labeled as Marxist. Uh, dialectical materialism was formulated by Engels and later by Lenin, but it wasn't actually something that Marx uh, developed fully, uh, from my understanding. Um, yeah, uh, anything else I want to say about Hegel? Um, I think that's probably it. Okay, the other person that I want to talk about is uh, Charles Darwin, who is also around at the time of Marx, and Marx is a really, really big fan of. And I think uh, when I first learned this, I was pretty surprised because um, I feel like when people talk about Darwin and politics, it's often in like a conservative way. You know, a lot of defenders of capitalism will talk about like survival of the fittest or like competition being a natural thing to justify capitalism. Um, but Dar uh, Marx apparently saw his his project as as very as a direct continuation of what Darwin was doing um, and even sent free copies of Capital to Charles Darwin when they came out because he wanted him to read them. Um, and I think like the best way to understand this is that both Marx in Capital and Darwin in The Origin of Species have very similar, on, are they on very similar epistemological footing? Um, in the sense that they're both confronted with these massive complex systems. Darwin has, you know, all of biodiversity and Marx has all of capitalism that both seem to be goal directed in some way. Um, and they both kind of take those things and deconstruct them into like basic axioms or constitutive parts that can show how like these societies develop over time. Um, for Darwin, um, you know, he says all you need is like, uh, you know, genetic variation, for, uh, like, for, like uh, inheritance and some kind of selective pressure. And if you just put that in a box, eventually you'll get, you know, evolution and biodiversity and stuff like that. Um, and then for Marx, he kind of tries to do a similar thing with capitalism, where he wants to look at what the underlying um, processes of this massive machine are. Um, I've heard of like his project in comparison to like normal economics is like we're looking at like the face of a clock and a normal economist would be happy to just like be looking at the hands moving around and take that at face value. Whereas what Marx wanted wants to do is look at 
know the gears underneath and like try to figure out what actually is making everything move. Um, yeah, I don't want to go on for too much longer. I feel like I've been talking too long, but yeah. And also I, I, I don't want to appear as some kind of like authority or anything. I'm really like, um, I've read a, a couple of secondary sources on this and, and like, I don't want to seem like my interpretation of this stuff is what's correct or anything. Cool, thank you. Um, I know that like other people in this group might also have uh, some background in this, uh, if people like thought of something that they think is worth sharing. Sorry, we're, we have a spiel, but we're deciding how to do it. Give us 21 seconds. Okay. Um, oh, wait, actually, I have, I, I want to show this thing. I have this poster. This is a, a Diego Rivera mural. It's kind of about like communism, I think. But noteworthy is that Marx is on, on the way on this side and on the exact opposite is Darwin. Mm. So I'm not crazy. The other of it agrees with me. So. That's really cool, actually. I didn't. I didn't know that about the the mural. Um, where'd you get the Where did you get the mural? The like the thing of it. Uh, my ex got it for me. <laughs> okay, wait. Do you um? Are you guys ready to spiel? Sorry. I think we're just ready to get into the text and hear, hear everyone's thoughts. Okay, cool. Um, okay, sounds good. Um, so initially I was thinking we would uh, like, I, I just to preface this, um, volume one is addressing money capital up to the realization of value and so in this conversation, I wanted to center value as something that we try to like unpack. Um, uh, and so what I was interested in people doing is uh, writing for like, let's say like five minutes about, um, let's see what I wrote down. My prompt is what is value to Marx? And then what does it mean to you? Um, and if you can only get to the first part of that question, like that, that's that's fine. Cause um, I think what I, I was interested in getting is if you uh, if you disagree, um, basically. But um, maybe we'll actually spend seven minutes because I know that question's a lot. Just just again, again um, what is value to Marx, and then what does it mean to you? Okay, um, so now uh, I'd like to hear what you guys wrote about. Um, does anybody feel comfortable in sharing? Oh, cool. Go ahead, Chris. Cool. Um, I wrote Marx thinks of value as revealed to you. And, uh, can you hear me? People here, Chris. Oh, okay. Um, and yeah, and value basically. Um, and then value to me. Oh, I think it cut out a little bit. Could you repeat that, like closer to it, the the speaker? Like, it's like a spirit, but just like. Mark, value is revealed to my neighbor. Me, uh, value brings joy, growth, progress. It like keeps cutting out exactly. I don't know if this is happening for other people. Can you guys hear? I mean, read it. I feel like you just gotta yell at it. 
Okay, I'm gonna yell into it. Okay. So, Chris wrote that value to Marx is congealed human labor, um, and that value to Chris is brings joy, growth, progress, lessons, sustenance, and nourishment. That's Chris's counter to Marx. Got him. I can share mine. I wrote a similar thing, if that's cool. I wrote that I wrote um, value equals labor, um, but then I was like, I think he's only talking about value under capitalism. And so I was like, to me, value is a dazzling infinite spiral of presence and opening our subjectivities to all the salty, blue, spiky, big things of the universe. I think Marx would agree, but that homie just wanted us to vibe, but he's trying to describe capital here, not his own feels. Sad face. That's my hot take. But, uh, anybody, anybody else? I wrote this like long ass, like, scribbly thing um which uh is like okay value is exchange value of a commodity um which is uh the simple form um and it's a relational phenomenon but value actually derives from usefulness and labor but the labor is obscured through the fact that it's a private act and it's the exchange that's socially visible um and shows its like worth in the money form um and then my thing was like, I think, I, I don't know what value means in German, like what all of the implications of it are, like how it would translate because value just is such a general term. And so we can like warp it to be like whatever we, you know. Um, but I, uh, I said a sandwich is more valuable to someone that is hungry. So like value is about, um creating a category of an entity and then assigning need to it um and so like water is valuable like rain is valuable to the earth you know what i mean like you can just have like any kind of individual and section it off that way um does anybody else want to share Okay. Um, oh, go ahead. I was thinking about um, like the difference between like use value and value, where like uh, like use value is like I think closer to like the way most people would think about something being valuable, because it's like um, a use value is like just something you can you can do with an object like for instance like if you have two coats that has twice the use value of the, the first coat and um i thought actually i thought that was kind of similar to what chris was saying that uh like they thought value was like in that sense that it's like something you can get i don't know you put it really nicely something like 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 something about like you can use it for like some kind of development I forget what you said but it was really nice but I think that's kind of like use value whereas like exchange value is like literally like it, it makes you quantify things like I thought there was one really good part where like Mark says like use value is kind of about like the qualitative aspects of something whereas in order to have an exchange value you need to quantify it somehow like either in like units of that thing or like in like duration of labor or something like that so i thought that was an interesting thing yeah um I think like I was a, I wanted to make sure that I had understood this correctly but is value like when he says value is that 
also exchange value? Is it like the same thing? My understanding is that exchange value is the manifestation of value in social relations, but it is like just the form of appearance, I think is the language he uses for value, which is this thing that's like, depending on which Marxist economist you follow, like either impossible to ever actually know how much value is in a thing or it is measurable, but it's this thing that kind of like hovers above and behind commodities, like this weird abstract concept of like the amount of labor congealed in it. Um, and exchange value is just the moment that that commodity enters a relation with another commodity, how those amounts of congealed labor that make them you know like this whole thing in this chapter i feel like is like what is this thing that makes all these totally different things this book this shirt this hat what is the thing that makes it so that i can trade all of them for one another like that makes no sense they're all completely different things he's like there's this thing hovering behind it which is the amount of labor um like congealed in these objects that went into them and it's like impossible to measure but it like kind of like gravity like you can only see gravity in its effects on objects Grab gravity itself. Um, that's my understanding of the distinction between value and then exchange. I don't know if that clarified or just was. I like really agree with that reading actually. And that one thing I wanted to actually comment on was like you said something about like how like exchange value or like valueism makes it so that we can equate things that are completely different qualitatively and have nothing to do with each other. And I think like another interesting consequence of that is what that does to labor because there's this one part where like hold on let's see if i can find the paragraph um yeah okay so like there's this one sentence which kind of summarizes what you said where he says if we make abstractions from its use value we, may, we make extraction at the same time from the material elements and shapes that makes the product a use value. We see in it no longer a table, a house, a yarn, or any other useful thing. Its existence as a material thing is put out of sight. And then the next sentence, he kind of says the same thing happens to labor, where he says, neither can it any longer be regarded as the product of labor, the labor of the joiner, the mason, the spinner, or any other definite kind of productive labor along with the useful qualities of the product themselves, we, are, we put out of sight both the useful character of the various kinds of labor embodied in them and the concrete forms of that labor. There is nothing left but what is common to them all, all are reduced to the one sort of same sort of labor, human labor in the abstract. So like, it's kind of, so he's saying like, in the same way that now we can have like different objects that are somehow comparable for like no reason, now we can also say like that like this entire like spectrum of human activity can be considered under the same heading labor whereas like in without capitalism there's no way to there's no reason to think of like for instance like farming and like bussing tables as like the same kind of activity at all like they're completely different qualitatively except under capitalism, they're forced into this abstraction of labor so that we can give things value, I think. I have a lot of thoughts that I want to start spinning, but I also don't know if we want to slow down and do like a comprehension check of like, okay, wait, what are these words that we're all using? And like, just go through and maybe have like good working definitions of like use value exchange value and value. Right. I think getting those three down would be like, because they're very weird. They're concepts that's like you think you get, and then sometimes he says things and you're like, wait, what? I thought the opposite of that was true. What the hell? Or at least that's my experience. That's how it was you're like, oh, I think I get it. And then he's no, like, but I don't even know why you're like, oh, it's not a commodity. Oh. <laughs> I had grew some watermelon at my farm and Raymond was eating it for breakfast. And I was like, this is one of the few like non commodities. And I, you know, like I, it was a Robinson Crusoe thing, you know, like I grew this, I brought it home. There's no exchange value. It's just like, here's a fucking watermelon, man. Um, yeah, I don't know how people feel about doing 
any good working definition. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Um, we can uh, start at the beginning of the chapter uh, just by defining like what is a commodity. Um, and I guess, um, okay, does, does anybody, do, do you, yeah. Does anybody, is anybody confused about what a commodity is or like have any questions about it? I, what it says is um, it's an external object, a thing which through its quality satisfies human needs of whatever kind. Um, the nature of these things, whether they arise, for example, from the stomach or the imagination makes no difference which is really interesting because I think it allows for like intellectual commodities um, or, and then he like starts to use physical commodities or like uh, the physical form or the physical object and talks about like sensuous materialism, which in my interpretation, it just meant something that's like, you can interact with, with your senses. Um, but, but it seems like this could be expanded to, um, intellectual property or something. I don't know. I think for me, the things I like to highlight in that first little part is the first sentence where he's like, um, I mean, I can read this shit and then listen to it. Um, where he's like, the wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense collection of commodities. And just in general, whenever Mark says like appears, that's always like a good place to like, make a little mental note because usually what he's saying is like we are living in a society of illusion so like you look around you and you see all these commodities you go to the supermarket and you're like this is the source of our wealth all these objects look at all these objects that our society has produced it appears this way um but you know what the kind of chapter is starting to pull apart is like when you look at this commodity okay what's inside of it there's this use value like okay i can eat the banana but there's also this exchange value. I can pay money that I sold my time to get to get this banana. So I'm like selling this weird abstract concept of like human labor to get this banana. So it's like this use value and this exchange value are within this commodity. And then like you keep pulling apart all these layers. And at the bottom of it is like human labor and the land. Like that is what, when he says like appear, the source of our wealth appears as commodities. What he's saying is like, that's what's so terrifying about capitalism. It's, it's this world where you look around you and you're like, oh, these objects, that's what our society produces. That's the source of um, But what that's hiding, you know, through all these other little concepts he's gonna create is like, oh, it's you and me working together. That's the source of our wealth. It's the land we live on. It's our relationship there. to each other. There. Yeah, one thing I've been thinking about as I've been reading this is like, I've been just like looking around at like all the stuff I have and thinking about like like wow like like human energy went into all of these things like someone like made this shirt you know what I mean and like someone like like constructed my water bottle over there and like you know it's like crazy to think it, it makes you really it really makes you think about like we're like way more connected to each other than we think we are and I think like a big thing that like I think the whole point of like branding, for instance, is that you forget that. Cause like, if you have like a Nike shirt, then you're like, oh, it's just Nike. But you forget that like, no, there was like some dude working for Nike who like put that together and like made that for you. Yeah, I don't know. I've just been thinking about that. Um, I, I agree with that a lot. I was thinking about that um, with relation to food and um pain and like the idea of like going to a restaurant and always getting the same thing and having like global franchises where you can go to a restaurant like anywhere get the same thing um and that it yeah and especially with something like food where like at least i have a relationship to food i try to keep where it is like very tied to the people that made it um where in like the the, the fran like the creation of like franchises um, Regan, for example. Um, yeah, it makes you just think about the time. Like, the last box or something. Yeah. And that, to me, the last part of this chapter where he talks about commodity fetishism, that's like one of the most like 
Most of moments in the book to me, even though it happened so early on, where it's just like, yeah, like what Raymond was saying, we live in a world where production happens in a black box, where like, you know, I have all these objects that if I were to trace their social lives, like from production to transportation to like, you know, like who made this pen and who shipped it and the clerk gets the, you know, Dollar General that sold it, like all these people probably fucking hate their jobs, are miserable as shit. But when I see this, all of that labor, all of that like human energy that's inside this pen, Apparently it was stolen. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, just like all of the the social relations that made this object don't exist, and all I get is thirty two cents or a thing I can shop with, I guess. Um, but like it all disappears, um, like the whole world evaporates, and I'm just left with an object that has value. Um, yeah. The part that um. The, the mind, not my mind, but yeah, the part that it really got me, like, that I hadn't thought about in this way was when it was just like, like, the accumulation of wealth is the accumulation of, like, other people's labor. That'll freak yeah, you out. Yeah, that like, like, yeah. Oh, just, oh, just wait. <laughs> and then labor friend. is a commodity? It gets, sorry, we got distracted from making definitions. Good. No, yeah, I think the, but the thing is, is, like, uh I think it's like also you're you're seeing things as like more than just um like like when you're like using the one thing it like becomes about the use value of it and then and then when you when you're like thinking about the whole system of things and like like I think it just proves like when it becomes like a, a whole um like when you're seeing it in like the general form um that Marx talks about it's like uh yeah, you're seeing it as like a, a everything is like in reference to one another, and it becomes like uh, uh, this exchange, and it just starts to get like really muddy, and like you're like, how does how is this worth money? Like, what would I even price this as? Even earlier, I was like talking about like trying to sell my own art, and I was like, I don't even know how to calculate like what this could be worth to somebody else, or like how does how to like put it through all of the equations to figure out like what. Um, like the amount of gold essentially that it's worth. Um, but yeah, uh, if we, does uh, Zane, do you wanna like, I don't know if you have a copy with you, but do you wanna uh, define like what use value is? Um, I'm sorry, that was super call out. That was, yeah. Um, I think it might be, it's, I think it's on the top of 128. Or 26. <laughs> I have a different version than y'all, I'm sure. So uh, that's, you just give me a second. I had it here a second ago. No worries. I, I think, um, do you, you can do exchange value. And I think Gray just said that she can read it. Yeah, do you want me to just read what I wrote down for use value? Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think this is pretty much just from the copy that I have, like cut and dry. But um, I wrote that like use value, according to Marx, is the, nat the natural worth of anything based on its capacity to serve the necessities and needs of for like human conveniences. Um, and a, it, there's like a quote on in my copy, it's page 16, but it says use values become a reality only by use or consumption. Um, and that as use values, commodities are above all of different qualities, but as exchange, oh, this is different. This goes into exchange values. Um, but as exchange values, they are merely different quantities. Sorry, that cuts off into Zane's part. But I think, I mean, that like, it makes sense to me, I guess. But like, as I continue to read the first chapter, I feel like things like continue to like, just get muddier and muddier and at some points it just felt like I was just reading the same like words over and over again and it, it was just I don't know it got a bit confusing but um you know I, I guess it, it it does make sense when put like simply like that That's yeah totally I think it's like 
like getting the definitions at the beginning are just so like crucial because by the end you're just like like if you I think that when I first read this I like didn't uh I didn't have like a good grasp of it um just because things also just got muddy at the end and you're like why are we talking about Robinson Crusoe like what is going on um yeah so like the usefulness of a thing makes it use value um and it's yeah so do does a use value depend on its use to a certain entity like what do people think or is it like is it consistent? Like, is there a consistent use value universally? Um, I personally, I see it as like relative, like, I don't know. I mean, just like what you wrote, Lena, for like values, like where like a sandwich is more valuable to like a hungry person and stuff. I mean, I think like, um, yeah, it's definitely like very relative to like, the context that it's like whoever like is you know consuming the thing you know it i guess it all depends just as a, uh, just as another example uh something i was just thinking about is i broke my toe not too long ago and i had this little boot that the that they gave me and now i just have no idea what to do with it it's like should i keep it maybe somebody else i know might need it or should I just throw it away? Like, what do you do with that? Like, it has no value, like use value to me anymore. I, 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 yeah, the, what it, I think like use value is really interesting because it's like, it definitely is relative because the way he sets it up is it's like something that can like, you know, like fulfill some kind of necessity, but obviously necessity can be variable. But then the thing that I think he's really using when he talks about use value is like the fact that one thing that isn't relative is that all use value is derived from like physical characteristics and like uh, material like things about the object, like the use value of like the like the like foot brace you're talking about is from the fact that it has like the physical shape of a foot and it's in made of some kind of material that like will support your ankle and stuff like that and it's interesting because i i don't i don't disagree with the fact that like use value does seem to be like something that could vary depending on the user but i think when i was reading it i was seeing it as more something that was like uh something intrinsic to the object which is why it, it, it can't be it can't be what makes exchange value work because if you're able to exchange objects that have nothing to do with each other physically, it must be that exchange value is generated by something that is not physical or like, which is abstract human labor. So I, so I don't know, does anyone like have any ideas about how to reconcile this? Because I feel like I like, I definitely don't disagree with you guys in that like, there seems to be some kind of relativity in use value, but at the same time, it seems to be like what he's connecting to like objective like qualities about the object. Yeah, I just had this, I think that's a really good point about the physical characteristics because it reminds me of like, okay, say like Zane, in your case, um, the boot would be valuable to somebody who wants to use it in like a weird ass art piece. And then, uh, you know what I mean? And then it suddenly becomes like, or, or like it, it can change its use or something or, or like its physical characteristics. Like say you could undo it, like, like use the physical materials for another purpose. And then it becomes the linen, you know, like it becomes the A commodity that uh, like in the book. Um, and so uh, it doesn't necessarily have to maintain its use for it to still have value, in other words. You know what I mean? Like its physical characteristics can still um, like inherently mean that there's value to it because there's labor behind it. Does that make sense? I have like some, uh, I don't know how to phrase it. Um, I think that 
use value can exist without value um, is a thing I sometimes Marx says it in a way where you think it's not the case, but there's a passage where he describes like things that are present to us prior to human labor acting on them, like raw materials, uh, river water you drink immediately with no one, yeah. air you breathe, like there's all these things that are use values that don't have value. You couldn't go to a market and exchange them. Um, there, there's no human labor congealed in them rather. So I think in the art foot piece example, what's happening there is that the use value, the material qualities of that object that are producing use value shift from like, oh, the thing that is useful about this is that it holds my foot. Dude, the thing that is useful about this is that it's weird and artsy, um, but that's still just a use value changing, which I think speaks to Zane and Gray's point, where I think I'm also on the side that use value is a relational thing of like whatever person brings to that material. And it's always going to be, um, like Raviv was saying, in that material, but a use value of the same material can shift from this helps my foot to Mm. I don't know if that makes sense. But what's... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, like, the way you phrased that actually made me think that, like, because I was afraid the stuff I was talking about in my little introduction was kind of, like, not worth anything. But actually, it makes me think of what I was talking about with, like, how, like, Marx is all about, like, mind creating world versus world creating mind. Because, like, that's kind of what we're dealing with here, where, like, if a use value is something material, then it's only material it's only like something we can track insofar as it's useful to like someone who's like interacting with it so it's like kind of this weird like dialectical relationship where like uh like use value must be something material and objective but at the same time it's not something you can even conceive of without the idea of use which would require like a subject to like interact with it and something I don't know. It's an interesting thought I had. Yeah, I think I was listening to a, one of the David Harvey uh, things about it, about chapter one, and he said that there's a um, a dialectical relationship between use value and exchange value, um, and I think that has to do with. Um, I don't know. I think that maybe they they have to like. I, now that I, I now that I think about it, I don't know what that means. My brain is like breaking. Um, I think mm -hmm. though for for like what uh, about like use value exist can exist without value. Um, I think in uh, I guess it really depends if the if in this example like if the boot was just given away. Then it doesn't have like uh like there's no exchange value because you're not bartering anything like you're not exchanging it for anything but i mean like if if you were to sell it off for some different value you know some for some different use value which doesn't matter but like if it if it's still if it's being exchanged i guess uh that would be different um i think like use value doesn't have anything to do with like trade or like a social relationship a specific social well, i remember one thing from i was watching uh there's the, uh, maybe i'll like if i can i don't know if there's like a anywhere we can put resources and stuff but um okay bye gray um hi there's a hi. bye gray you're super oh they're gone <laughs> um there's this writer that i was introduced to you by the, another reading group I was in named um, Moisha Pastone. And he's like a historian of Marx and he has a really interesting reading of it. And I've been watching his lectures on YouTube on Capital. And I remember one thing he said was that for the most part, the categories that Marx sets up in the beginning of this book are supposed to be historically specific to, to um, to capitalist society, but he, he also mentions that you could argue that use value is something that exists 
that could exist in a non-capitalist society like for instance in like uh in like a um in even in like a hunter gatherer kind of setup there's still use value because people are like using things and use value also that what that means is that use value isn't tied to a specific like social relationship or a specific mode of production in fact like things arguably could have use value even if they weren't produced by human labor like if you just found an orange on a tree like that would have use value but um but yeah i guess yeah I, but now, now I'm thinking, I'm not sure, because you could still, if you got an orange from a tree, you could still sell the orange, which would mean it has exchange value, which means it has labor value, which I guess would just be the labor of you picking the orange. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess what I wanted to say is that like value, capital V value, which appears as exchange value, like Ross was saying, is something that's specific to capitalism and like cap the capitalist mode of production whereas use value is just like arguably can happen in any kind of society that's, yeah i super agree with that reading in that text i think there's lines throughout where he's like use value is a universal of human existence labor is a universal of human existence the weird things that are existing under capitalism are specifically exchange value as the way we understand value actually i was i not to i appreciate this but just to push back on one thing i i think arguably labor is not a universal thing i think labor is specific to capitalism insofar as in that one paragraph because we because you were at we were actually talking about this how like the whole thing that value exchange value does is it makes it so that you have to consider a labor as an abstract concept, right? Because there's no need to like think of, to have some kind of umbrella term that encapsulates all the different work people do unless you're using it in the way that, you know, like commodity value is using it. But, but I think, I think like, but yeah, like we were talking about that earlier. So I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to like attack you or anything. Um, yeah, I think it's just the three terms there. I think when I say labor is um, outside of capitalist social relations, um, the idea that if how Marx understands labor is taking the stuff of the world and forming it to meet human needs, that has existed in all forms of social relations. Um, I think like wage labor or um, yeah, labor understood. Yeah, labor understood is like a, a measure of time um, that that stuff is like. Yeah, maybe I've used the Yeah, I think, I think maybe we can say like know. abstract labor or something to be clear about it. But also the point about time is really interesting too, because that's what uh, that guy Pustone, his whole argument is basically that like capitalism is about like time and shit. It's pretty mind blowing, but yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense even like I can see that in Marx because it's a like his argument is all about productivity which is all based on time and all about like efficiency and so um and that changes the the value of the product if you can make it faster it becomes cheaper and so then what what happens is that you're not like you're not like oh I have more valuable objects everything just becomes invaluable like not valuable you know, like not as valuable. And so there's just like a surplus of things and the value is only in what money it can make. And so there's just like producing a surplus. Yeah. yeah. I read a quote really quick that I think will clarify the past questions about labor and use value. Um, so for me, it's on page 133 of the Penguin edition. Um, labor then as the creator of use value, like useful labor is a condition of human existence, which is independent of all forms of society. It is an eternal nature, it is an eternal natural necessity which mediates the metabolism between man and nature and therefore human. Um, so I think that's the idea that, yeah, these values exist in all forms of social relations. Laboring exists. The weird thing we have now is this market that needs all these values. Turn them into these values, abstract. Yeah, 
er erase the world of people and their lives working to create in a society where objects I don't know if I mm -hmm. um, did it cut out for you guys a little bit also? Yeah, um, it's okay. Uh, I know we have like five minutes left. And so I just wanted to um, cover uh, what the commodity fetishism was. Um, Cause maybe, maybe this is something that we could push to the next meeting too. Cause it's just such a big topic. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Did anybody have anything to say about the commodity fetishism or like what, what their definition of it would be? I have to say I, I struggle with this part. So if anyone does have like a good like thing to say about it, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I I uh I like literally read it this morning. I was like, and and it just occurs to me how like um like the language that Marx uses is so like literary and romantic because he refers to it as like a mystical character of the commodity but um what how I read it was and and this is something that um that David Harvey said as well that it the so it's um a commodity fetishism is when the social there's a social relation between things and then a material relationship between people so like there's like commodities start to be um, like have such dense social characteristics and start to like, um, they start to like supersede the human labor power behind the commodity. So the social aspect or like the exchange value starts to like matter more than the use or labor behind it. To me, the commodity fetishism is just uh longer way of restating that first statement of like in capitalist or the first sentence in the book was like in capitalist society wealth appears as commodities like that's it that's that's the fetish is like that we live in a world where when you look around we think that the basis of wealth in our world is objects rather than human life and the earth Yeah, that helps a lot, actually. Yeah, I think uh, I it, it seems like I think because maybe it's just like the um, the really like logical way that he sets up most things, like especially just with that first sentence, he just like jumps right into like what the like what a commodity is and he could have started with like anything but he, he chose that I think like um when I could get like little bits of really like strong emotion behind his writing I got really excited and so when he talked about uh the absurdity of money the money form in that part um, and he's just like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, and he like follows the whole genealogy from like a simple form um, of like uh, equality, like the equivalent value thing. Um, and then it like leads up to the money form. And he's just like, see, it, we might as well be saying like linen is worth this, this much gold, but they're not the same thing. Like we're saying equals, but like what? Like they're not the same thing. Um, and it's just like really arbitrary. Um, uh, he was saying like, the that money like conceals from it's like a, a a shell like and even in the footnotes he just kept being like it's it's a veneer like it doesn't make any sense um yeah one thing i also really like about this sections is he like is constantly also making reference that knowing like reading marx be, be, or being marx and knowing that you live in a society run by like commodity, commodity fetish doesn't change your relationship to the fetish. Like knowing that behind all of these exchange values you see when you go to the supermarket, knowing that there is, you know, human labor that is hidden behind that, knowing that there is a relationship to the earth that's hidden behind that, like that does not fundamentally change your relationship to living in a society of commodity fetish. Um, that, that's this concept that like kind of horrifies me and like haunts me a bit. Um, just the idea that like, 
the only way to get past this society is to like you know build a society that has different values that has a different way of making sense of how we produce things and how we like care for one another um yeah that chapter it's like it's not explicit but it is like the beginning of him planting this like revolutionary seed in his writing of like you can read this text it's not going to liberate you it's not going to help you you know what will help you is like building a better world um and that's that i don't know just the, those seeds are already planted it's, it's like, yeah there's a there's a, a really cool there's uh yeah that reminded me of something in like uh in Zizek where he's talking about like ideology obviously and he's he says how like at like at this point like even you know, everyone knows like that money is not like real like to a certain extent people know that like money is just paper or like digits in your bank account and it's just like not like a real thing but no one could like actually act like that like no one could no matter how much you believe that like money isn't a real like it's just a construct no one could actually like act or behave in that way and i think that it's like that 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 falls into like again this like materialist versus idealist thread because for marx ideology is like a material force it's not like just like some abstract thing for him ideology is like a real like material force that's and, and i think that's kind of what he's referencing here that like even knowing about ideology and like or fetishism doesn't really preclude you from it or like it doesn't like you said it doesn't liberate you i i really like that yeah it's almost like we're, we're reading this text we're having all these conversations where we're like capitalist social relations make absolutely no fucking sense they're all absurd and all of us are gonna like end this call in a few minutes and then go out and sell our labor and buy commodities and act as if like, oh no, this all totally makes sense. This is all just how the world is and just do these completely insane things. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a spooky, but also hopefully like inspiring call to like change social relations and not just like make our brains bigger or whatever. Okay, <laughs> a call to action. Uh, yeah, I like, um, I'm like so excited that I understand more of this now than when I first read it. And I think um, even though there were like some things that I didn't understand, uh, I think that like, I was just surprised by how much there was stuff that I wouldn't understand at the beginning of the chapter and then continuing to read, it would be like readdressed. And then I'd be like, wait, I actually get it better now. Um, so, so I'm excited to move forward. Um, do you guys have any like suggestions for how we should conduct meetings in the future or like what format would be ideal just for like having the meetings? Uh, not necessarily like for the meeting specifically, but I thought maybe having a group chat would be helpful just so we could clear up some stuff outside of just this, uh, like two hour type talk. Yeah. Or like a discord server or something. But... I don't know what that is. What's that? Yeah. Um, I, I like the definition of this. Um, and maybe if we have like a, oh, maybe the answer is that. Um, Um, no, nah, I like the meeting. It was good. I did see them in spaces. Uh, because they're fun. Um, yeah, I think a group chat could be good combined with, um, maybe like an outline of like what we're going to be talking about, but I know that like puts work onto someone. So, you know, that can happen, that's fine too. Um, and that can kind of happen organically, like in this, this or group chat is like bumping, you know. Mm -hmm. um, like here's what I found confusing. I mean, yeah, about this. Yeah. Um, but I generally like really did this. Um, you can see all. I hope you understand a lot better. I'm gonna read more. Okay. Uh, we could also use the group chat as like a way to uh, 
like to just like have people or like put the definitions there so that everyone has a good idea of where we're starting uh and like people aren't put on the spot with like use value find it in the book uh and then then we can have more time to expound on those kind of ideas during this time definitely um yeah i wish i i have like a, a little outline and i wish i just sent it in the group chat and i think um yeah i think uh is like uh does anybody want to like work on like I'm, I'm wondering if if you guys think we need facilitators and if like you're interested in taking that up for different meetings on different chapters i think i'm pro facilitators just in the sense of like structuring a conversation of like these are the terms we're going to try to cover the questions we're going to try to cover just to make sure we and time um yeah and i know chris earlier said that she wanted to facilitate i would too at some point oh yeah wait i didn't i didn't hear what chris said fully wait could you um you can, okay you can text me also um uh <laughs> We uh wait. What did you say earlier? I I just said that um, go to as as possible and then um like kind of a check in with everybody at the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Um. Okay. Is anybody interested in like laying out an outline for the next meeting? Are we doing chapter two next time or are we are we are we gonna try to do commodity fetishism or um uh, i feel like we should try to move on if we can but like um i don't know it's up to you guys i had this idea of it was like a we would do chapter two chapter three and then follow this like uh like these um there'd be 12 sessions. Cause there's like almost 30 chapters. We would just, in some meetings, we would like put stuff together. I can send a list of like what I have planned out um, for like what our readings will be every week. Um, yes. Did Rojas, did you, did you put your face up close? Cause next meeting. Yeah, if no one else wants to, I got you. Okay, beautiful. Um, okay, nice. Um, uh, okay, cool. It was so good to see your guys' faces. Um, I'll see y'all next week and send out the like another email with more stuff. Thank you for all you did organizing this and guiding us and just making this happen, Lena. This is super cool. fucking cool. Yes, Lena. Oh, of course. I'm so glad uh, we're all here doing it. Um, I'm so excited. <laughs>